When it comes to human evolution, many of us will naturally think of East Africa. And this makes sense given the significance of the East African Rift Valley for our understandings of human evolution. As we've already talked about, there are numerous fossil sites spanning up and down the Rift Valley that have been central to our understanding not just of the evolution of the genus Homo, which we'll talk about today more, but our evolution of earlier hominins as well. So as a reminder, the East African Rift Valley stretches from the northeastern Horn of Africa, basically the Afar Triangle region, which we've already talked about, down here through the Lake Turkana Basin, where we'll talk about today. It splits into a western branch and an eastern branch, and extends all the way down actually into Malawi in southern Africa, which we'll also talk a little about a little bit today. Now, We've already talked a little bit about several key sites and several key transitions associated with the origin of the genus Homo. Today we're going to talk about some of the richest samples that we have available to us for this early Pleistocene time period associated with early Homo. And they come from areas of the Turkana Basin, located here in northern Kenya, and then a few specimens from Olduvai Gorge located in Tanzania to the south. To start this conversation off, we're going to start off talking about this specimen, ER 1470. Now this is a specimen that's caused a number of controversies in terms of how to best interpret it, in part because of the enigmatic morphology that it preserves. If we look at the specimen here, the most striking feature of ER 1470 is its very vertically flat face. We can see that very clearly in this image here. Coupled with that vertically flat face, it has a very large cranial capacity. The neurocranium is quite large in terms of both breadth, height, and length, so it's a very large specimen. Given that, it was very much, when it was discovered, thought to be representative of the earliest representative of our genus Homo. That flat face, recall, is a very human-like characteristic. Expanded brain size, also a human-like characteristic. So it seemed to encompass many of the features that we associate with early Homo. However, there are a number of things that have made this interpretation slightly more complicated. First of all, this cast that we're looking at in this image is actually made up of several disconnected pieces. There's actually a fracture that runs right here in between the nasals and the frontal bones, another fracture that exists over here, and you can see there are these big gaps both in the right zygomatic maxillary region and the left zygomatic maxillary region that make the interpretation of this specimen more complicated. Even when the specimen was first discovered, Alan Walker, one of the researchers associated with it, pointed out that it's missing many of the key morphological elements that might help distinguish it actually from earlier Australopithecines or from the robust Australopithecines. Nevertheless, there are several notable features about this specimen in addition to its large size and its vertically flat face. First of all, it has a very broad palate, and you'll notice that the roots of the zygomatic, the roots of the cheek, come very down low onto the maxilla. Again, this is a bit of an enigmatic trait, because this is a trait that we oftentimes see actually with earlier hominins or with the corresponding Australopithecines or robust Australopithecines at this time period. Looking at it in a different image, here you see the superior view on the left and a posterior view on the right. And you can see that there's a little bit of post-orbital constriction here on either side of the skull, again consistent with other specimens that we'll see in early Homo. But again, it's actually a very large bulbous uh, neurocranium. The specimen doesn't preserve significant temporal lines that extend all the way into the sagittal plane of the skull, so there's no sagittal crest or some of those other very large masticatory structure features that we see with the robust Australopithecines. Looking posteriorly, much of the posterior portion of the skull is relatively smooth and not very well developed, but there is a nuchal torus that runs along separating the occipital and nuchal plane of the back of the skull here that shows some degree of development in this specimen. Now, ER 1470 is just one specimen from this time period, and another important complicating factor in many of these specimens from the Turkana Basin is their exact geochronological position is somewhat uncertain. So ER 1470 is actually a specimen that we think exists maybe somewhere in the 1.8 to 1.9 million year time period, but there's some current research that suggests it may be even older than that, perhaps as old or even older than 2 million years of age. In this context, the exact position of these specimens in terms of their temporal position is very important, as you'll see, given the rich assemblage we have and the complicated picture of variation that that assemblage presents. The temporal sequence of the fossils matters a lot. We don't have any teeth preserved in the 1470 specimen, but there are other teeth that have been associated with the taxa that ER 1470 represents. So some people put ER 1470 to the species Homo rudolfensis, which is sort of a more primitive version of Homo and especially characterized by larger features, especially larger features of the dentition. This specimen, ER 1802, is one of the specimens that some people would place into the same group, Homo rudolfensis. And they do so on the basis of the robust dentition that this specimen has. If we look at the molars, we can see that this specimen has very large bulbous molars 
sort of pillowing out in some ways similar to some of the Australopithecine specimens that we've seen. But especially noteworthy are these premolars, which are very large and actually retain a fair amount of molarization to them. They're large, almost molarized teeth. Um, they're still bicuspid, you can see very clearly, but in many ways they're primitive with respect to some of the later homo specimens and even perhaps some of the contemporary homo specimens that we'll talk about. The corpus itself is quite robust, and it's a very large, thick mandible. Uh, now contrast that, however, to one of the specimens we've already talked about, OH7 from Olduvai Gorge. Recall that this was one of the specimens that Philip Tobias used to establish the species Homo habilis. And again, you can see that there are some differences. The large molars are quite similar between the two specimens, uh, in terms of their overall proportions, but OH7 appears to have more reduced premolars than ER1802. But again here, the temporal difference between these specimens might matter. It's possible that OH7 is 100,000 or 200,000 years later in time even, so part of the difference between the more primitive looking premolars of 1802 and the more derived premolars that we seem to see in OH7 may be the temporal gap between them. Now the large features of 1802 actually correspond to several earlier specimens, including this specimen from Malawi, from the side of Uraha. Now this is a specimen that's been dated to about 2.3 million years of age, so it potentially takes the origin of Homo back quite a bit further into the past. And again, you'll notice that it has these very molarized premolars, large M1, what we have preserved of the M2 suggests it's very large and elongated, and again, the corpus is even more robust in this specimen. So some of these large, robust, but not quite robust Australopithecine-like mandibles that it seem to exist between 2.3 to about 1.8 million years of age may be indicative of the earliest members of our genus. They may be indicative of this process of the beginning stages of reduction, or at least lack of expansion of the post-canine teeth. Maybe the earliest members of the genus Homo simply weren't expanding their teeth and hadn't yet really fully begun to reduce their post-canine size. Nevertheless, this is a question that's open to considerable debate right now. Whether these represent an early species of Homo before Homo habilis or contemporary with Homo habilis that we might call Homo rudolfensis, or whether or not they simply represent the earliest members of our genus Homo in continuity with Homo habilis. Now, similar in age to perhaps ER 1470, although it's possible that it's a fair bit younger, is this specimen from the Turkana Basin, KNM ER 1813. This is a considerably smaller specimen. It doesn't have nearly the cranial height nor the cranial length as what we saw in ER 1470. And indeed, the cranial capacity for this specimen is considerably reduced. It has the double bar, fairly slight, gracile supraorbital torus. Um, it has a much better preservation in terms of the features of the face. We see this high root to the zygomatic, not the low root that we saw in 1470. Again, a more derived feature perhaps in this specimen. But its overall small size has indicated to many researchers that this is a very primitive specimen. Indeed, some people wouldn't even place this into Homo habilis, but would actually use this specimen as a reason as to why habilis should really be a late Australopithecine. That Homo habilis is more properly identified as Australopithecus habilis because of the key features such as small brain size. If Homo is really about encephalization and increased brain size, specimens like 1813 don't seem to fit that pattern. Moving forward here, we can see it in the superior view and the posterior view on the left. And again, we have more significant postorbital constriction on both sides. Again, we lack a really large, powerful masticatory apparatus, very different from what we see in the robust Australopithecines. We can see a slight amount of facial prognathism, particularly low on the face in this specimen. Looking posteriorly in the skull, we can see the widest point really is very low on the base of the skull, associated with the area just above the mastoid process here on either side of the skull. This we'll see is characteristic of many early Homo specimens. Now if we move slightly forward in time, maybe 100 to 200,000 years, but remain in the Turkana Basin, we'll find a specimen like this, KNM ER 3733. Notice in this lateral view that it has more projecting brow ridge. The brow ridge is fairly gracile in this specimen, but it projects more than those earlier Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis specimens. The neurocranium has considerable height and considerable length. Notice also the development of the posterior portion of this skull. It has a very broad face. What's preserved of the zygomatics and the lateral maxillary regions uh, are very well preserved and broad and much more like more later derived Homo, like Homo erectus that we'll talk about next week in more detail. Not necessarily like some of the earlier Homo habilis specimens that we've been talking about. If we look again at the superior view on the left and an oblique view on the right, we can see that that degree of postorbital 
constriction has reduced somewhat in this specimen, part again of that expanded brain size that we see. Um, we also get a little bit less subnasal prognathism on this specimen, though we don't preserve that feature quite as well on this specimen. And you can see that there's still this well-developed uh, inferior base portion of the skull. So again, the broadest portion of the skull is still here in the back. Adding to somewhat to the complexity of this picture, about the same time as KNM ER 3733 is this specimen seen on the right, KNM ER 3883. This specimen is very similar in terms of its overall morphology, but has certain features that might indicate, for example, that we have a female and a male of a single species. Notice that the supraorbital torus on this specimen on the right is slightly expanded relative to what we see in ER 3733. This may be indicative of a sexually dimorphic character, a male on the right and a female on the left. However, it's hard to tell in this picture a little bit, but you'll notice that there are a lot of cracks running through this specimen as well. So some of this expanded supraorbital torus might simply re represent expansion in the fossil itself associated with these cracks. So in terms of the overall morphology, actually, and overall metric size of these specimens, 3733 and 3883 are actually very similar. So whether or not these differences represent male and female, or simply variation within the sex, is an important question, and one that informs how we might taxonomically assign these specimens. Are they the same species, or are they different species? Are they males and females, or are they simply the same sex within the same species? Is this what normal variation looks like within a species, within a sex, separated by, say, 100,000 years? Now, to give you a slightly more nuanced perspective on this, we can consider this question of sex versus species in more detail. For example, we started talking off about ER 1470, this specimen right here. Now, perhaps similar time period, maybe just slightly later in time, is this specimen from Olduvai Gorge, OH24. Now, you'll notice that OH24 is not a terribly well-preserved specimen. It's crushed, fragmented. All of this white space indicates parts of the fossil that we don't preserve. But there are many comparable elements between OH24 and 1470. And what they preserve allows us to ask the question, is this a female version of 1470? In other words, is this specimen, which is typically assigned to Homo habilis, simply a female version of ER 1470, which some people would assign to Homo rudolfensis? So is this what normal male-female variation looks like in the earliest members of our genus? Recall that this debate about sexual dimorphism versus species distinctions is one we had with Australopithecus as well. And I think most people would agree that Australopithecus afarensis and most of the Australopithecines preserve a large degree of sexual dimorphism. It's possible that early Homo retains a large degree of sexual dimorphism. We're not that sexually dimorphic today, but it's possible that that reduction in sexual dimorphism doesn't happen right away, but gradually occurs throughout the Pleistocene. In which case, this might be male and female of whatever species you want to assign to the earliest members of our genus. If that's the case, and we move slightly later in time, then the specimens we talked about, 3733 and 1813, might resent, represent the same picture, just perhaps 200,000 years later in time, where again we might have normal male-female variation within this early part of our lineage. But again, that question exists. These four specimens right here, some people would break up into three different species. Homo rudolfensis, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus, or sometimes referred to as Homo ergaster, coming later. Now in the segment that follows this, we're going to talk about the newest introduction to this time period. That's specimens from the site of Dimenisi. These specimens have produced a whole host of variation a wonderful preserved sample of fossils that allow us to re-examine this complex pattern of variation that we see within East Africa, and potentially set up the evolution of Homo erectus, which we'll talk about next week in class.